weird that I'm going to open a message and quote scripture out of Proverbs. But Proverbs says, the memory of, a just, of the just is blessed, and a good man obtaineth favor of the Lord. And I see those two verses and think of my late husband. It's fair to say that he had favor of the Lord, a gifted man, teacher, friend, in my case, husband, someone who had the ability to light up the room with his smile and could also make you sink just a little bit in your seat by saying nothing. Yes? yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also think when I think about all the things that he did um, coming up, most of you know Dr. Scott died in 2005, February 21st. Now, we celebrate him all the time, every day. Mm, the network places teaching. We're constantly putting more and more of his works remastered, re-edited, and of course new publications in book form. But there are so many things that um, I've shared with you over the years that Dr. Scott personally was to me, things that he shared with you or maybe later I shared with you. And some of them are stories that are, are so classic Dr. Scott that you just kind of go, yeah, I, I remember that. There's so many of them. Um, the one that I've shared with you repeatedly, which is really, I think, one of the funnier things I've ever seen, a grown man with a PhD from Stanford who could hold court with heads of state and foreign dignitaries, but I still remember this. We were guests. He was being honored downtown, at one of the hotels downtown, and it was all of the city officials and all the politicians. At our table was the mayor, a couple of councilmen, and everybody was getting called up eventually to go and say their two cents before they called up Dr. Scott. And very interesting that while everybody took their turn getting up, Dr. Scott, this was the end of a meal, and there were little chocolates in boxes placed in front of each setting. And each time somebody got up, like the mayor got up, Dr. Scott took the box of chocolates and he bit into it just a little bit <laughs> and then put the chocolate back in the box <laughs> and set it back in front of the mayor. And he did that with almost every single person around the table. And except for Richard Alatori, because in Richard Alatori's case, he poured salt and pepper into his uh, soda. <laughs> He's a mischievous guy. But the funny thing was when some of these folks came back after talking and they wanted to take a bite of their chocolate. And I just remember, for example, the mayor's face. He came back and he opened up the box and he was, I think he was really looking forward to that piece of chocolate. And he, he, <laughs> He saw the, the bite and he went, oh, and he put it back, and that was his expression. Somebody else was like, what is this? Where's, who bit into this? And of course, nobody was catching on. He, Dr. Scott, after he was done talking, said, we better split before somebody catches on. But he's a troublemaker like that. I've, I've shared stories like that that are kind of interesting, that kind of sum up. He could sit, as I've said, with some of the most powerful people and have discussions on myriad, and pick any subject he could have a discussion on when he was sitting with attorneys. And there'd be, at times, rooms. You know, we'd sit with you know, several sittings of different folks, judges and lawyers and whatnot, and here was the walking corpus juris secundum. I mean, he could quote things that were straight verbatim out of the code to the attorneys, which would have to go and look it up somewhere. And in the same conversation, in that same setting, we could go from that to the habits of long-haired rodents. You'd have to be there for that one, good Lord. That one's kind of, um, it's not PG, so we'll leave that one alone. Um, but I obviously met Dr. Scott at a very difficult time in his life. And he was going through a lot of different things, which if you had been here for any amount of time, you know that it was... A difficult journey for him, but the Lord brought him through. 
And as I got to know him more and more and spent more and more time with him, suddenly it was kind of like we're together. We're, we were a couple. And I remember when he had had his heart attack. And he was hospitalized, and his mother was just down the hallway. They were both in the hospital at the same time. And some of the staff tried to sneak in some hamburgers. I'm looking at you, but actually you didn't do it. Somebody else did. You were just like an accomplice to that. You drove them through the drive through to get the hamburger to bring it to Dr. Scott. But I remember thinking then, I know I can help. I can do something besides just you know, being there all the time. And from his heart attack, and he said this publicly, so I'm not saying something that's not publicly known, I kind of helped him with his nutrition, because everybody knows he didn't have the best dietary habits. Uh, what were those peanut butter cookies? Nutter butters. Nutter butters. You know, when you have a rich diet of nutter butters and fettuccine alfredo that's from the freezer, uh, you, chances are you probably will need some nitro pills at some point. So I came in and basically tossed all that stuff out and said, we're going we're gonna to eat good and healthy, and I'm going to make sure that I do my part, like the, keeping the powder dry to make sure that you're healthy. And that began a journey of some interesting exchanges he even shared with you. I, I, I'm not a tofu fan, but I made tofu for him, and he said, tofu. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. We, we evolved in front of your eyes, um, our relationship, and of course, ultimately, uh, I remember when we both met, we both said, marriage is out of the question. Never. Of course, never say never. Because when he proposed to me, and it was the head of our denomination and the assistant sitting beside him, and he said, this is the lady I want to marry if she'll have me. And I just remember there was absolutely no hesitation. It was absolute. And shortly after uh, we got married, he was diagnosed with cancer. And that began a tumultuous journey. Hearing the words, you have cancer, uh, are tough. And then hearing them when you just gotten married are even tougher because it's like saying this unknown word. And of course, I think some of the greatest teaching on faith came out of his battles and his struggles, which I'm, I'm grateful to God that he was able to, to get them out and to articulate them and to share them because I think that over time that's helped so many people. Um, but in the background, I'm sharing this for a reason, which is actually part of my message, not just because I'd like to um, give a little memory and something to say about Dr. Scott, but it's actually part of my message, interestingly enough. I still remember going back to the day that Dr. Scott ordained me. And I remember thinking, why? Because he just, it just didn't make sense. And I've shared all these things with you, but I just remember thinking, what was the point of this? It just didn't make sense to me. And the feelings of insufficiency did not get quelled by him saying, we're not discussing this anymore. It just didn't go away. And I wrestled with that. And it wasn't until he had said publicly, in case of his incapacitation or demise, that, and he said it to the congregation multiple times over, that if something did happen to him, I was to succeed him in the pastorate. No one, I believe, no one in the sound of my voice really believed that that would be carried out. I think we all said, okay, that's, that's a plan, but God's going to work this out. And so it's kind of one of those things that, even though he had said it, I still felt the sense of insufficiency, and I also felt like it probably won't happen in my lifetime, so it doesn't really matter. I hate to say it, but the, the, that was my thinking. And... What's so remarkable is that God takes our insufficiency when we yield it to him, and he makes it sufficient. He takes the things that we know we don't have, knowing he knows the things we do, and he uses them. Some of the people in this church remind me very much of the disciples. 
who were with Jesus, they saw miracle after miracle after miracle. Yet when confronted with the need to exercise faith, they were faithless. Oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? There's so many references to their faithlessness, even though they saw miracles. They saw things that we will probably never behold in our earthly lifetime, and yet they still, let's not talk about doubt, they were faithless. And it reminds me of some of the people, probably not those that are present, but those who are not, who did not have enough faith, and I'm not equating Dr. Scott to Jesus by any means, but use the principle That is, if you follow somebody and they're right 99% of the time and they're off maybe 1% of the time, which he said this publicly, that's a pretty good track record. Even if you're off 10% of the time, that's still a pretty good track record. But you can't say you trust somebody that much to follow them with your soul spiritually. And then when a decision is made to appoint me, it's remarkable that none of these people while he was alive, complained to him. None of these people raised a doubt about what God could or couldn't do regarding his healing or my taking the pastorate. No one said a word to him while he was alive. Was that because they lacked guts and they were hypocrites and cowards? Or maybe in their mind they believed just like me. It'll never happen because God's going to heal him. But it doesn't matter. The reason why I'm pointing this out is because We need to glean from what's in this book and not treat this book as simple stories, although they are simple for a reason. Don't treat them like simple stories that are detached from your life and mine because they represent everything that we indeed do go through, experience, and it's like saying if you're not willing to take a page from what is there, tell me how can you apply any of God's word into your life and make it something that has an impact instead of doing what I call the faithless, cowardice thing, which is to say, well, the insufficiency is too much for me, therefore God can't. Now, God specializes in things impossible. There isn't anything too small or too trivial. But when I talk about, I told you, I wrestled with the, the insufficiency on my part. And the thing that struck a chord with me. It wasn't immediate. I knew two things. The day that I sat on the corner of his bed, just, I believe, possibly a week before he was promoted, I remember sitting on the edge of the bed and thinking to myself, this is the hour that I came for. I I didn't think I would ever think that because I thought I came to be by his side. But that was a purpose served, and a great purpose served for both of us. But I knew that God had something for me to do, even though I still wrestled with insufficiency. It was only maybe a year or two after his promotion, after much spending much time on my knees crying, crying to God for help, for deliverance, for anything. In fact, I told you I spent the first year asking God to do me a favor and blot me out because I didn't want to, I did not want to fail God. And the load was so immense and my thinking of insufficiency was so great that even though I knew the Lord would make a way, the doubts would wash over me so often. And the question would be, how is this all going to work? And one day it became clear to me. And I've been saying it ever since. This is God's work. I didn't create it. I didn't form this church. I didn't ask for the position of pastor. It's God's work. The Bible says he does everything perfectly, in his eyes perfectly, using our insufficiency. And in my case, now I'm speaking of me, but I'm going to speak of all of us in a minute. Using our insufficiency, putting us to the test to see if we'll trust the little that we have, even if it appears to be very, very little, to be put into his hands, increased and multiplied for his use and his benefit. 
Now, you've heard me repeatedly quote scripture to you, Romans 12 specifically, commit your, you're to place yourself on that altar, if you will, and trust that God, if God is God, has the ability, once you yield yourself to him, to use you. And that doesn't mean that each person is called to preach or that every person is called to be, everybody has a different role. That's why it was amazing to me when my husband passed that I heard every single type of thing, un undocumented, unfounded, not recorded anywhere. One person in particular said, oh, you know, Dr. Scott knew I would leave because I could never sit and listen to a woman. Well, let me tell you something. My late husband, for the better part of probably 25, maybe 25 years, was chauvinist, publicly. Um, that's not a secret. In, in today's world, in today's climate, oh my goodness. In our, you know. <laughs> but I can tell you this much. Some people that didn't understand his humor, because they either didn't understand his humor, or they didn't understand him, because he made jokes all the time. They were pretty funny jokes. They were, actually, if you think about it, you reflect back, they were really funny. He said, I'm never going to let a woman get on top. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah. Now, don't go carnal on me, you folks, there, okay? You know, some of you are thinking, oh. <gasps> but these were the reasons he used to say, this is his words, not mine, from the chauvinist mouth, women are superior. Now, I'm not saying that women are superior. I tell you, there's superiority in everything, and there's inferiority in everything. And I'm not one of these that's an equal plane. I'm just telling you that, you know, I'm, I'm just saying what he said. Those that didn't understand what he said and only heard selectively what they wanted said, oh, I could never listen to a woman. And yet, friends, when Dr. Scott was absent for many times, Mom Scott took the pulpit. Do you think he had a problem with that then? I don't think so. And God bless Mom Scott because, you know, she, she had the voice that you either listened <laughs> or you listened. Figure out which one I'm saying. I'm sharing all this with you to say, you know, we can make excuses for people's lack of faith or their lack of trust. We can make excuses for a lot of things, but then at the end of the day, you gotta sift it down to me and to you. Our individual responsibility to rightly understand what God has for us. Sometimes, as I said, in simple Bible passages that we read for another reason, and we overlook the real reality of what may be a second or third lesson, layers of lessons embedded in there for us to glean. So I'm gonna to talk to you about today what Christ does with our insufficiency because he is sufficient. And I'm going to take you first to John 6. Each of the writers of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, and John, or John and Luke, record the feeding of the 5,000. And why I think that's remarkable is many people who say not everything is... Um, recorded the same, but this is one miracle that is recorded throughout all of these writers. And you have to kind of go between the accounts to get certain details. And there's some interesting insight as well to glean from this. So uh, remember, insufficiency made sufficient. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them, which were diseased. Now, I want you to just catch something here. If you read and put all of the accounts together, it is quite possible that it is, one of the accounts says it's um, the Passover, and this one also says in the Passover, Feast of the Passover was nigh. So great multitudes are gathering. They should be gathering 
in one place, yet they're following Jesus. And they're following Jesus, why? Because it says they saw his miracles, because he was healing people. It doesn't say that they were following him because he preached great messages, unfortunately. It doesn't say they were following him because he preached about the kingdom of God, even though he did. It says they followed him because they saw his miracles which they did on them which were diseased. Something that the eye could behold and visibly say, and you know the whole history of Christ healing people, the paralytic, the blind, the lame, all of the people that he healed were visibly you could see that person who was sick, who was dying. Let's exclude Lazarus who was dead because he's not in the mix right here. That's the reason why they were following them. If you put a real good spin on this and even try to make it fit, I'm going to say that this is what most people, most of the time, most people, most of the time, out of desperation, if they didn't hear the gospel and they get sick out of desperation, some healer comes to town, puts up a tent somewhere, they'll go. Desperation does incredible things to even non-believers. Jesus went up into a mountain. There he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, what an interesting thing to ask Philip where can we buy bread? And he said this to prove, to prove him. And the folks that tell, say, you know, God doesn't test anybody, that word I've taught on ad nauseum, the Greek word perazo, which is to, to test, to see what was in Philip's heart, to see what was going to come out of there. He said this to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered and said, 200 pennyworth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. 200 pennyworth. And if you go to some of the other accounts, it would be that amount to eight, seven or eight months' salary. Even if you had that much money, there's another problem, which is where they're at, even if you had that much money, Probably you're not going to be able to buy that much bread. It's not like going down to Vaughn's right here and you got all this bread. you got a bread aisle. It doesn't work like that there. Small village, and even say this is like a, a kind of deserted spot. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? Now, we'll, we'll read another account in a minute just to make some some details come more vibrant. I'm gonna, I'll take you to Mark in a minute. Jesus said, Make the men sit down. There was much grass in the place, and the men sat down in number of about 5,000. And elsewhere we know it's 5,000 men plus women and children, and some would estimate that the account would be as, as many as minimally 7,500 people who w would be fed that day, and possibly up to 20,000, depending on how many women and children. But certainly it says 5,000 men. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples took them that were set down, likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. And when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them which had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet, that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to him to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Now this is John's account of this. If you go to Mark, and they're very close. I don't want you to think you're going to find something that's so staggeringly different. But if you go to Mark, and that would be in the sixth chapter, because there's some details recorded here that I actually think are 
quite important, which will let me get down to the nitty-gritty of what I want to share with you. Mark 6, beginning at verse 30. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught, because Jesus had sent them out. He sent the twelve out, and they came back. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest, rest a while. So the first thing I want you to notice here, Jesus sees his disciples come back, and he tells them to rest a while. Tells me something. The Lord knows when we're tired. You know what happens most of the time when we're tired? We, we want to take a break. Usually we need a break. And rest is good. You can use rest as a weapon. But a lot of times when the Lord has something for us to do is not the time to take a sabbatical. That's what most people tend to do. When there's something that the Lord's going to have you do, that's when most people decide it's time for me to take a break. And usually that's right at the cusp of the Lord having you do something when you are completely drained. And I found this over the years of ministry. When you're completely drained, usually that's when God, hate to tell you this, is going to probably have you do something. And it almost becomes, if I'm so tired and I let the flesh take over, then maybe I won't do. It's a strange thing that happens, but I've seen this. He tells his disciples to rest a while because he knows they've just come back and they're tired. I'm trying to tell you, don't think like some people say, well, I'm going to take a six-month break from serving the Lord, then I'll come back refreshed. Really? You think that's the way it works? Because it doesn't. If you're serving the Lord, you're serving the Lord. No, it kind of reminds me, I got to say this this way, it kind of reminds me of um, if you are familiar with any of the monarchy, let's just take them, the queen, and not maybe so much in modern times, but in, in um, let's say, the last hundred years before, before Queen Elizabeth, you always had this servant, and I'm sure they still have it now, but it was more so then. Servant is on all the time. There isn't a time when a servant is not a servant serving at the behest of the monarchy. Servant is serving all the time. And that's what Christendom is sorely missing. You're on, you're on call all the time. And I'm not just talking about being a pastor. I'm talking about serving him, walking with him. You're on call all the time. You may not be doing something in active duty, but for him, serving the king, you're on call all the time. There isn't some switch that you put on and off and say, okay, I'm serving now. No, I'm not serving. You either are or you're not. And if you are, you are. Sorry, that's just the way it works. Now here, back in Mark, it says he tells them to take a rest, right? Rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. So they're tired and hungry. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. So you think. The people saw them departing. (laughs) Not so quick. Many of them knew him and ran a foot thither out of all the cities, out went them and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away. This is the difference between the master and the disciples. I'm going to beat it. It's been a long day, Jesus. I'm tired. Now, don't just, you know, because you read this and you're so familiar, I want you to see that a lot of times this is what we do. Don't just think, oh, there's the disciples here. This is what we do. We couldn't be bothered with somebody else. Eh, tell them to buzz off. Right? Come on. We've all done that. Doesn't matter that these people saw and traveled I want you to think about it just so you can get a visual. It's not like they traveled that far from the boat ride because if you calculate the the road map of their travels, it's probably not more than maybe three or four miles. 
in, in the boat that they took, this little boat ride. That's not very far. And the people were on land, <laughs> just following along. So of course, I mean, it, it, if they came from afar, they're tired, they're hungry. And listen, you know, Jesus looks at them and he's got compassion because he says they're like sheep not having a shepherd, he began to teach them many things. But the disciples said, come on, Jesus, it's late. Tell them to beat it. Send them away. We're tired. We, you know, we just came back from a witnessing mission. You know, we got important stuff to do here. You know, you're, you can talk all you want. We're tired. You said take a rest. And the only rest we got was that little three, four mile little dinghy ride that we took with you. And it wasn't much of a rest. And we saw the multitudes. We said, ah, look, right? So send them away that they may go into the country roundabout and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. You, you give them something to eat. <laughs> yeah, give them something to eat. Okay, the master's going bonkers, right? Maybe he needs a rest. Give him something to eat. And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? Now, please just latch on to this. They've seen miracle after miracle after miracle. You would think that one of these would have said, Lord, when he said, You give them to eat. You think one of them would have said, Lord, you give them to eat. Now, the, re the reason why I started in John and read that passage out of John, because John starts his gospel with, in the beginning was the word, and the word spoke, and out of nothing created everything. So the same word, the living word now, the logos, the living word in the flesh, Christ, who can speak and make all things, you'd think that they'd say, Lord, you speak it and not your word, just like many times over. At his word, he spoke something, and it was. You'd think that that would be the mindset. Now, I don't know about you. I haven't seen miracles like these things that are recorded so much. But I can say, since becoming a Christian, I've seen many things that I would say would be difficult to explain away. They're not magnificent feeding of the multitudes, mind you. So you come to know something, that and your you're, you're learning about God through his word. You come to know how God is. But they were with him, and you think it would have been, well, he's done all these miracles. There's nothing that's too small for him. Let him, let him feed the multitudes. Faithless disciples, even if we had that, even if we had that type of money, it still wouldn't be enough. It still would not suffice. He said to them, how many loaves have ye? Go and see. And I love those three words, go and see. Because that's the problem with most of us, where we are required to do something. I gave you my example of me in ministry, where something is required of us. We are so quick to look at what we don't possess and what we don't have, rather than what is available to us. And the thing that we see as insufficient, God says, put it into my hand and I'll show you the, sufficient, the sufficiency of it once I bless it. Once you've yielded it to me, I'll show you how sufficient it can be. This is not just about giving money or giving things. And this, this is not a parable or a story about how we should all share with one another. I've heard people caricature this incredible passage with so much teaching in it and making it into some something that it's not. Here is what happens. He says, how many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew they said five and two fishes. Now, of course, in the previous passage, I told you, they found a boy, an unnamed boy. And the miracle of the unnamed boy is up until this time, first of all, if, if all these people were traveling all day, it's a miracle somebody didn't kill that kid for his food. I'm just saying. Number two, it's a miracle that this kid yielded the food. You know how kids can be, no, it's mine. <laughs> he yielded. And he commanded them, 
make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down by ranks by hundreds and fifties. And this is another miracle that's overlooked. Because people tend to gather. You know, you see stuff on TV where people are gathering. It's like a mosh pit. People are tossing themselves all over the place and flailing, and it's all crazy. Everything that Christ did, there was order. Everything was ordered. He says, make them sit down by groups. And the miracle, I don't know if it's a greater miracle that he fed the multitudes or that the multitudes sat down. They actually took the instruction and sat down as he instructed them to in an orderly fashion so that there could be the, ava- the availability for people to pass in between. Of course, Jesus knows what he's going to do. So they're organized, and it says, and when they had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, when he had taken them, he looked up to heaven, blessed and break the loaves, and he gave them to his disciples to set before them. Let me just start right there. I'm going to start my message kind of right there. There will always be needy people. Remember when the woman poured the alabaster box, the contents of the alabaster box on Jesus, and he said, the poor you'll have with you always, but not me. There will always be needy people. And I'm not strictly talking, again, about supporting people with food or with money. If we're really understanding our condition, we're all very needy. Before God, we're all beggars. We're all destitute. There isn't anything that we can bring to the table that God says, oh, well, you got enough over there. You're good. I don't need to talk to you today or at any given time because you've got sufficient. We're all needy, but there's a big difference between being needy and being greedy. I find most people come into the church and instead of understanding their needy condition, they become greedy people and they'll listen to people talk about how God is going to bless everything that you have. Let me tell you, right here, it's pretty clear to me how God blesses, and the the track record is pretty good, how he blesses. It says he, he broke the loaves. I think I've preached a couple of messages, and so Dr. Scott did too, about God will bless usually when he breaks. He breaks the individual this, the bread is no different. Remember, the insufficient amount of provision made sufficient in his hands. And what does he do first when it's in his hands? He blessed it. He broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. Anybody else looking at this would say, you're just talking about the feeding of the 5,000. You know what I'm talking about? A, a bigger principle, which is, how we tend to make excuses. Let me talk about money for a minute, because this is the one that always gets my goat. No one will take out of this and say, you're right. I've heard people say, boy, if I had money, I'd, I'd give to the church. But I just don't have. But when I do, I will. Now, you ask somebody, what do you mean? If you had $10,000, would you give the $10,000? Well, yeah, if I had it, I would. If you had $5,000, would you give $5,000? Well, I guess if I had it, I would. Well, I only have 10 bucks in my pocket. Well, you have 10 bucks in your pocket. Now, if you had 10 bucks in your pocket, would you give it? Well, I, I, I would, but I can't because I need it. That's what most people do. That's how most people treat giving. And I, I, I'm sorry to make it that ridiculous, but that's what most people do. Instead of saying, the insufficiency that I have in God's hands will be blessed and increased because I've committed it to him. Now, don't make this the rule, as I said, of giving everything away. I'm not suggesting that. I'm simply saying that you can take from this all you want, your gifts, your talents, the things you think, well, I I don't have enough. I've heard people say, well, I'd, I'd help you, but I'm just not trained in that area. Okay. That maybe that's a good thing. Maybe I don't want your training in that area. Maybe you're going to be just like me because there's nobody that gave me training in the area that I'm occupying right now, okay? This, came, this package here came with a lot of fumbling and disaster right in front of your eyes. So don't make the excuse of saying, well, I'm not sure I can do that. I'm not sure how. No. So you get the idea here. And says, 
they took all this and divided it among them all. They did eat, and they were filled. And they took up 12 basketfuls of fragments and of the fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. And this is what's so amazing. And 12 baskets, how many disciples? 12. 12 baskets remaining, one for each person that was with Jesus, each disciple. Kind of as if to say, and so you think I can't make it enough? Here, you're going you're gonna to carry out the stuff that remains. Now, you know, if you read in Mark's gospel, it's kind of strange because after they leave this event, you think, by the way, this one event which people tend to, people who don't like to actually analyze the Bible will say, well, it couldn't have really happened that way. But, you know, if you're going to make something up, if you were going to fabricate this story, it would be pretty hard to fabricate feeding that many people and getting that many people to corroborate if you're going to try and get people and corral people around to say, well, did this happen? Did you see it? Were you there? Oh, I don't think so. I wasn't there. I, I didn't see it. Did you see it? No, didn't see it. That's not the way it happened. The record here by each of these writers tells you there's very good evidence that this is the way it happened. But what's so sad is it says they got, right after this event in Mark, it says they, they went into a ship, went into the other side, and if you keep reading... You, you realize that they, for whatever the reason, a storm kicks up the, the water and they see Jesus walking. They thought it was a ghost. And they were afraid. And Jesus tells them, be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. And then, of course, they were amazed at what just happened. And verse 52 says, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. See how quickly this happens? This event of feeding the multitudes, and it's so quickly out of their mind that this is the same Lord that can, out of nothing, out of a little insufficient uh, lunch of a young boy, provide for a whole multitude, and the same Lord can't calm the sea and calm the weather? How quickly this was forgotten. And this is why I said to you, this is what's amazing to me. If you pick this apart, you'll find a lot of things that we have in common with the disciples. And if you want to admit it or not, if you don't want to admit it, that's your problem. The little faith element is always there. Like, oh, you know, I know the Lord brought me through that. I know the Lord delivered me from this. I know the Lord, I know it was the Lord's doing to do this thing over here. Let me ask you this. I stood in front of you for many years and I said, you know, people were lamenting because they said, well, you know, you don't have a degree and you know, you're, you're not educated like Dr. Scott was. And then I, I kept telling you, you know, who am I? Because I don't, I don't have a finished education. And I went on and on and on. And suddenly, I think the Lord was like, okay, enough. I'm tired of hearing about this. And opened a door for me to get my PhD, which I completed. And the thought process is, I'm not sure how I could even describe that even happening. Because I don't have time. And yet, the Lord somehow opened a door and carved out a space, and it, that's, you know, anybody else would say, ah, sure, that's the way it happened, but that's the way it happened. So we need to be always looking for what God may do when we yield the insufficiency. As I said in my case, I'm sure God was saying, okay, enough already. I don't want to hear about it anymore. Maybe that's what God's going to do to you one day. You're saying, you keep talking about something. Well, I don't have, you know, I'd like to do this, and I don't have those talents. And maybe God one day is going to say, enough already. Silencio right? I don't want to hear about it anymore. And go to bless you with that thing that you've been lamenting that you don't have, and then put into his hands, you see the increase in the blessing. This is not a prosperity message. This is a reality check on what Jesus does when we yield the thing we deem insufficient or not enough into his hands. And there are certain elements that come with it. The first one I just said is being like the bread being broken. Don't ever think that God is going to bless without taking you through a valley or two. And it's usually in the valley, in the famine, in the darkness. It's usually there that God blesses, not on the mountaintop. God could have done things many ways for me in my life, but instead he chose to let me at times be in complete darkness 
and suffer it out, just like you. In other words, let's see what she does while she's there, when I spent most of my time crying, lamenting, weeping, instead of saying, the Lord will make a way. The Lord will see me through. The Lord can do this thing because I didn't, I didn't make this thing happen. The Lord did this thing. You see what I'm saying? At some point, I've got to ask you something. What's, what's a greater miracle? Feeding the multitudes with the little or the Lord opening up a selfish heart instead of send them away looking on somebody with compassion, not because it's a work, but because this is God working in and through you. What's a greater miracle? That the disciples were so easy to say, send them away. Remember Jesus' words to them, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Were so easy to say, send them away. Later on, they would lead others to follow them as they followed Christ. Insufficient education. The disciples, they weren't, they weren't, they didn't have any degrees, come on. But they were with the master, and yet being with the master and being exposed to the master for those three plus years, during that time we've got a whole chronicle of faithless individuals who could not get past to see God would take even faith the size of a grain of a mustard seed and multiply it to move mountains. They could not see that. What am I saying to you today? And I could make this a, a giving message, and I could say, this is, this is the way God will do something. Yes, but I don't want it to just be a giving message. I want it to be a complete message that shows you no matter where you think your insufficiency is. For some people, and I'll just say this to you, for some people, maybe the insufficiency is if you're a mother or a father, you feel insufficient or inadequate to equip your child. Again, Take that insufficiency or that feeling of inadequacy, yield it over to the Lord, place it in the Lord's hands, and the Lord will, in, will bless, probably break, and then increase. And that's not like, oh, this is the prosperity uh, way to do things. This is saying this is a commitment of your life, not for a little time, but for eternity. I'm not sure how people figure I can trust God for a little bit some of the time, but I can't trust him for everything all the time. You take the little bit. Christ's sufficiency is always enough. Now, let me just say one other thing. He breaks, he blesses, he breaks, and he gives it back to the disciples to distribute. I want you to think of how this could have taken, different scenarios in which this could have taken place. First scenario this could have taken place is the people could have sat there and said, gosh, I am hungry, and Jesus could have went poof like that, and everybody would have had a, a McJerusalem chicken manna sandwich with extra mayo on it, okay, in their laps, and it would be like, oh, we were fed the food of angels delivered to us. We don't know how, all right? It could have been like in the Old Testament, manna raining down. It could have been in a diversity of ways, but... There was a lesson specific, I believe, not, you think it's for the multitudes, but he says he, he had compassion on the multitudes. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. The lesson was indeed for the disciples. The greater lesson was for the disciples. If you will commit the little that you have, I am Christ, the Lord who is able to make it sufficient but he gave it to them to distribute. And I've said this many times before, God uses human conduits. Don't expect for angels to fly into your bedroom tonight and flap their wings in your face, because if you really know what angels look like, those wings would probably wipe you out and knock you to the other end of the room. They're not little uh, dragonfly-type wings. They'd be big wings. Just saying, some people have a cartoon idea of what an angel looks like. It's like fairy, fairy godmother, the tooth fairy or something. No, pretty scary individuals the way they're described. But, but people think that this is the way it should happen. Expecting some interesting, out of the ordinary way. But God says he uses the human conduit. He used the very vessels that didn't have the faith to say, Jesus, 
you provide, Lord, you provide, he uses those same vessels to distribute the thing that he has broken, blessed, broken, and multiplied, increased, and says, now you take it and you distribute it. Think about that. It means that there could have been talk for this. This could have been chronicled a different way. Can you, can you imagine the talk of the 5,000 saying how miraculous this thing happened, but yet he took, Jesus took out of the very ordinary stream of life to show his power in all things, especially when it comes to our need. And you notice something. Matthew, Mark, they all say the same thing. They all ate and they were satisfied. It means their bellies were filled. They were satisfied. It means that when we have received something from his hand, we can be satisfied. I know people who walk around all the time and they are never satisfied. They never have enough. It's never enough. It'll never be enough. There's always this constant idea, I need more. I need. That's why I said needy people versus greedy people. And the reality is that when Christ gives you that which you needed, this is another message I preached many, many years ago. The Lord will give you the thing you need, not the thing that you think you want, that you desire, but the very thing that you need. Don't be anxious for tomorrow. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things that you need, not the things you think you need, but the things you absolutely need to make it. He'll provide them for you. That, I can tell you, as a living witness, and I don't like to give testimonies, but as a living witness, that is the way it works. If somebody says, well, I have a calling on my life to do something, but, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not ready yet. Oh, believe me, it doesn't matter if you're ready or not. The Lord's going to come. When the Lord taps you on the shoulder, you're going to go answer. Which brings me to the last thing. If, I've said this before. If the Lord actually calls you to do something, you're going to find somebody that you can sit down with and say, please pray with me. You're not going to be some puffed up, I lorded over the people now because the Lord called me and I'm in ministry so I can just terrorize everybody. I can be tyrannical and mean and malicious because I'm a person of God. And you're going to be on your knees praying with somebody who's fervently going to pray with you and agree with you for the Lord to guide you in every step you take because it isn't a game when we're talking about people's souls and educating them on the things of God really requires the focus to get people. We're all over the map. We're like uneducated in the things of God, yet we come off as experts. We know this thing. Harnessing in people who are, their thoughts, you know, some of you have already gathered wool while I was talking five times already. You left me and then you came back. <laughs> then you came back, right? It's a difficulty of being in this position because you realize the responsibility is so great. And this is my final point on this whole parable or this whole story, which is to not focus. We spend a lot of time focusing on what we don't have. I did it in front of you. I confess to it. I did it in front of you. I use my education as an example. You spend so much time focusing on what you don't have that you spend no time focusing on what you do have. If you have a little bit of faith. You know, I was by Dr. Scott's side when he was told he had cancer. I had nobody by my side when I was told I had cancer. And I remember sitting there saying, no, the Lord's going to help me through this because there, there ain't no way. That's exactly the way I said it, just like that. Good English. There ain't no way. Not in denial. And the Lord saw me through. And what I'm going to say to you is the Lord will see you through as well. When you quit looking at doing this, it's not enough, it won't be enough. I have a little bit of faith today. I'm, I'm weak. I'm not feeling well. I'm sick. I've, been, I've taken the blows throughout the week, the month, the year. I'm a little bit low. I'm a little bit low on faith. Well, then, my friends, I suggest, how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing the word of God. You sit yourself down. You turn on the network. There's 24 hours of teaching playing. You sit down. You tell your kids to go play for a little bit or find a babysitter. You find some time to sit down to where you can recharge your batteries, gleaning out of the teaching to get 
new, a new faith fix for the day, because yesterday's faith ain't going to carry you through to tomorrow. A new faith fix that will carry you through today. Tomorrow you start all over, because tomorrow some other blow will come and knock you down sideways, and you'll think, what, what happened? And you've got to gather new strength. Don't make the mistake of being as faithless as these that saw, repeatedly saw, they saw, they witnessed, they saw, and they never, until, until Jesus actually came out of the grave and showed himself. And even then, there was still one who said, I won't believe until I can put my fingers in the nail holes. Let's take a page out of this and say, out of our insufficiency, Christ is sufficient. Out of our lack... He can provide. He is the Lord of all. And when I say provision, don't limit it to pocketbook. Don't limit it to health. Don't limit it to anything. If he is the Lord indeed in control, he's spoken. He did all these things. He's able to speak it into your life. How does he do it? Through the word. And that faith comes into your heart. And once more you say, the Lord is able. And instead of being like the disciples and saying, it's not enough. And we don't even know where we could. And even if we had that type of money, there's no store that would have that much bread. You might say, I don't have very much, Lord, but what I have, I'm placing in your hands because in your hands I know the increase, the blessing. Maybe I'm already broken. Maybe you've got to break me some more. I don't know. But the blessing will come and the increase will come in your hands because it's not going to happen in mine. That will still be the flesh and my works thinking I'm doing it. But in your hands, Lord, it will be blessed and the increase will come and you will be sufficient and it will be sufficient to see me through. So not sure where you are in all of this, but I know out of this lesson comes the greatest thing I can tell you. Don't say, well, I'm looking at what I don't have. Look at what you do. And stand in your faith and say, Lord, you've given me that gift. Let me build on it each day by growing more and more, listening to the word, growing in more faith. And each and every day I'll take that challenge, Lord, with the little bit that I have that you will increase and multiply it, cast into your hands because I trust you. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.